Well, hey, welcome everybody to um, another uh, segment in the Women Lead Online Forums. I'm Patty Vargas, and today we are uh, doing one of our Truth is a New Black segment. And Truth is a New Black is a kind of a fireside chat style virtual conversation led by our own Sean Marie Turry. We like to say it's real talk about business and life and career. It's about desire and disappointment, you know, and so really it's about truth. It's about truth and what it really takes to create a life and a work that you love. So let me tell you about Sean Marie before I turn it over to her. She is a multi-passionate, multi-talented business strategist who helps businesses get things done and leaders to lead better. She is an irrepressible seeker of the truth. And as a master desire map facilitator, she's taken hundreds through her programs. And she is, I'm happy to say, my partner in crime here in the Women Lead Online Forum series. So Sean Marie, I'm dying to hear what you've got for us today. Let's hear mm. it. Thank you so much, Patty. And ladies, thank you, all of you, for being here. Those of you that are listening to the recording, thank you so much for tuning in. And I hope that you enjoy our wonderful session tonight. And I am so tickled that I get to introduce Chris Noel from T&T &T LLC. She is the visionary and the CEO and founder. And she is a magic maker and an optimist bringer and a money conjurer. Uh, and she is definitely the right person to have tonight's conversation with. So tonight we're talking about money and transforming and changing your money story. And we are doing a deep dive into why numbers are everything. So Chris, I would love to kick things off tonight. If you could give kind of a Reader's Digest version um, about your background and why, um, gosh, I feel like maybe I'm the one that should be telling this, but why you're such a, why you're the right person to have this conversation with tonight and uh, kind of what your, what your history is and what your story is with how you came to be, you know, passionate about helping people with their finances, because it's definitely not something that everybody is suited for. And you are my friend, uh, you're the one to go to. So yeah, I'm so happy to have you here, Chris. So what do you think? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And hello, everybody. Um, in a nutshell, let's see, money is not something everybody loves to talk about. So how did I get started in this? Um, we just, you know, uh, we'll start way back in the beginning with, uh, I was in the foster care system as a child. And when you go without things, you learn to really hold what you have sacred. And then graduating college, my final semester found out I was pregnant with uh, my first son. Um, and uh, my husband was going, was in an academy. So we had $700 a month to live off of. And when you're graduating college, you have these big ideas of what you're going to do and where you're going to go and the career, all that was shot out. So I was on welfare and WIC and AIM and all of these government systems. Um, so then fast forward where we grew out of that, had another kid, um, the 2008 recession hit. Um, and I was an accounting assistant and um, an HR assistant and assistants are the first to go when recess recessions hit. So I got laid off three times in one year. Um, and one time you can kind of manage, but when it's three, it's devastating. We just had our second kid. We had just bought a house. Um, and so I was so tired of this cycle, this financial cycle of being broke and living paycheck to paycheck. And it was just I was humiliated and I was embarrassed and I, I just had so much shame that, that this was where my life was at that point. Um, so I launched TNT and I put my husband and I on a $20 a week allowance. Um, and here we are, uh, what, almost 13 years, 12 years later, um, where studied um, everything about money and entrepreneurs and, and gap accounting um, and how it fails every entrepreneur that I've ever worked with. So um, that's, I just love money and I love challenging women to charge more for their services and to pay themselves more mm -hmm. um, and to own it and feel really, really good about that journey. So that's, that's me in a nutshell. 
Mm. Chris, how much, like, regardless of how much you have, how much of growing your wealth, of manifesting more money, of generating more money, of selling more of your product or bringing in more clients, how much of that do you think is directly connected to your mindset? Oh, uh, I would say about 80%. It's behavior, it's mindset. And then the other stuff you have to learn, a skill set um, and education on finances and, and teach yourself how to think that way. Um, but I would say, um, you know, determination and consistency mm. with, with having a mindset about earning more and paying yourself more and not working 80 hour work weeks um, is, is definitely a mindset. So, so part of tonight, we're talking about helping people change their story around money. And, um, and I just want to take a quick pause here and just thank you and acknowledge you for your absolute transparency and uh, taking us. I know it was kind of a rapid fire journey. And I, and I know you, Chris, and I know there's so much more to your story, but, um, you know, sharing with us that you came from the foster system and um, and I, and how that affected the way that you looked at money and, and, you know, and having things and being able to take care of yourself. And, and I just think the tenacity and the willingness to, to identify not only that you wanted it, but that you deserved it. Like, I don't, I don't think that that I think that's such a big component that's missing for a lot of people. And I've seen it across the board. I've seen people that have very little and they just can stretch it and make it work like they had hundreds of thousands of dollars. And on the flip side, I've seen people that have had hundreds of thousands and millions and they're constantly trying to catch up. And so specifically with regards to helping people change their money story and the power of numbers, right? That was part of what we talked about too, that numbers are everything. Uh, I'm wondering if you can unpack that a little bit for, for us and, and talk about, you know, maybe for those of us that are maybe stuck a little bit in our money story, like whatever it is that we heard growing up, like money doesn't grow on trees or you have a champagne taste and beer pocketbook or you know, wanting money is greedy or sinful, um, like all of the stuff that we hear that isn't even ours, right? That we, that we grow up hearing and we kind of, um, a lot of us, not everybody, but so many of us tend to absorb that. So how do we begin to kind of break those patterns and, and strategically look at numbers where we can maybe start to get that extra support of identifying like how do I really create a successful empowered uh, business that is profitable oh, that's a lot in that question so, um, I'm sorry take take whatever landed for you please okay because you, for that you've got such wisdom to share <laughs> is everybody here a business owner uh Christy is not okay, Christy is not okay so Christy so is in accounting okay <laughs> So your field, Christy, is it accounting? I'm a financial analyst. Okay. So you're super familiar with GAP. Um, so GAP is general accounting principles. It's what, when y'all go to, I won't say y'all, when we get our degree in business and finance, GAP is what they teach us. So when you look at a P&L, you look at it as revenue minus expenses is your profit. And we call that at TNT broke even. Um, because using that philosophy, you're never going to break even. You're always going to be broke even. It's, and it's a, it's a reoccurring cycle. So um, Sean Marie, when you asked me, how do we change our mindset or the story we've told ourselves growing up? Um, gosh, that's heavy. That's loaded. And I think it's so personal for each one of us, except the only thing I can tell you is financial health, financial skills, it's all, it's sorry, it's all skill set. It's like confidence. The more you use it, the more you grow it. Um, I mean, like today I'm wearing black lipstick. I've never done it. And for some reason I decided to do it when we're filming, um, which I was not prepared for it to actually be black because when you buy <laughs> lipstick, you know, you're not sure of the color it's gonna turn out, but it's black. So I tried to uh, lighten it a little with glitter, 
which it didn't work. So that's what I'm saying, right? But I just rocked it because whatever, I can't get it off because it's that eight hour stay stuff. Um, so that's how I do things. You know, you go big and you go all in. Financial well being is the same thing. Um, figuring out the story that you're telling yourself and the tools that you need to get out of it is the first step. Um, and then getting help. So that someone's going to hold you accountable that when you start going down the same spiral of the finances that you don't deserve to make what you want you deserve to make or you deserve to work 80 hours a week to make $13 an hour. Um, these stories as you're going through it, you need an accountability partner who's going to tell you no, like if you want to work 80 hours a week and that's your sweet spot awesome work it if you want to work 20 let's figure out how to make the same amount of money you're making now in 20 mm -hmm. hours a week. Um, and so just the more you start doing these skills and consistent, your financial story will start to change. People like everything think that it's going to happen like this. You're going to hire an accountant. You're going to hire a financial planner. You're going to hire a bookkeeper and things you're going to hire a CFO and things are going to change immediately. Like it takes a good one to three years to change your financial story. Um, it takes that long to lose the weight you want to lose. So it's not an immediate get rich quick scheme. Um, so that's really what I could tell you. I have spent 12 years changing my financial story, 12 years. So people are coming in on the end of, of my financial journey and I'm an entrepreneur. So like everything, you know, blows up every day. Um, but they're seeing where I am in life and um, wanting that where if you're just starting your journey, it's going to take you one to three years to start having good habits. And then from there, you're going to have explosive growth and seeing what you want to do and being able to travel and buy and purchase um, things that you want. So Sean Marie, you did do a good thing that I've heard though, or even seen, because we mentor businesses that are make $65,000 a year up to 10 million. Like we run the whole gamut. Um, and the people who are in the 65K a year are so frugal with their money. They like scrimp and like are you sure chris are you sure or whoever their their mentor is like i don't want to spend the money on that and then you get to the businesses that are multi-million and they're just like oh that's just two hundred dollars not a big deal for a lot of stuff like and they're the ones who are in hundreds of thousand dollars of debt because they just they don't they don't have the scarcity mindset anymore so a great book I would totally recommend is The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, where no matter where you are, you are a frugal entrepreneur and you are justifying everything as a need versus a want scenario. Um, so that's really, that, that reading that book changed my life. And I think I read it maybe four years ago. Um, and it really changed my mindset as an entrepreneur and how we budgeted it internally. Beautiful. Let's talk about budget. You just mentioned budget. So uh, to actually, if we can, I want to divide this kind of into two, a two-part question because you and I spoke a couple of weeks ago. And even though I, I'd already had this experience, having it said back to me was really powerful. But I asked you, what is the difference between a solopreneur and an entrepreneur? And then we started talking about the, the different way that they make money or the way that they look at money or the way that they need to spend money. So if we could talk a little bit about the difference between entrepreneurs and solopreneurs, and if you have some feedback for those of our lovely ones who are with us that are either solopreneurs or entrepreneurs, or they're on a career path, but they're thinking about entrepreneurship, um, or they might even be somebody, Chris, who works for a company where this information would be really beneficial to just how they think about business, right? Because I'm gonna take a quick segue here. I know that I've had eight businesses as an entrepreneur. My very first business, I had 33 employees. I was in business for 10 years, made lots and lots of money and I wanted to shoot myself. Like I was so in over my head, overwhelmed. We kept growing and expanding and I was reacting to the growth instead of managing the growth. I was really young really inexperienced. I wouldn't change it for the world, but I just think back on that. I'm like, God, what could have happened if I would have been managing this train instead of just letting it, you know, kind of chasing after it, which is constantly what I felt like I was doing. But in between every business that I started, I worked for someone and I realized that if I, if I would have had some of this information who I could have been as an employee, as a contributor, as a change maker in that business that I worked for, uh, 
it would have been game changing. So I, I just, I want to address anybody who's with us tonight or anybody who's listening that this isn't just about entrepreneurship and solopreneurship. Like this is really about how we look at business overall. And I think that again, this money story, like it, it weaves in and out of what we do every single day. So, um, so for those of you that are with us and listening, this is for you as well. Uh, but Chris, back to my question. So the difference between solopreneurs and entrepreneurs and the different ways that they um, run their business financially, like if you've got some tips and insights for them. Okay, I'll try. I don't remember what I said a couple of weeks ago. So that's I'll okay. To, it to the best of my ability. Okay. No, and, and Chris, I'm, I'm just going to say to you, it's... Um, you're so lovely and transparent. Like it's, it's not even about what you said. It's really about like going back to our, like truth is new black. It's really about your truth. Like you're so dynamic. And of course, you know, your, your company is, um, is TNT. Um, so no pun intended at all, but it just happens to be really apropos. So no darling, it's, it's really just like, what is true for you? Like in this moment? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for You're giving welcome. me that grace. You're okay. Welcome. So solopreneur and entrepreneur, there's two very different um, types of, of people that we mentor. Solopreneur, it's, um, and if this, ugh, I hope this lands well um, for you. So solopreneur, a lot of times they are just freelancers, basically. They are looking to not to make their own schedule, to not be employed by someone else, just have the freedom of their own creativity. A lot of times, though, kind of what Sean Marie said, um, things start spinning out of control um, and you do find yourself um, maybe underbidding jobs, working 80 hours a week. I th keep throwing 80 hours a week because that was my story. That was where I was um, because I thought I had to do it all and be it all. Um, so solopreneur, a lot of times you are just in it for you. You really um, aren't looking to grow a team. You aren't really looking to... Um, get to the multi-million dollar status, you are just looking to live your life for you, um, travel and do all the things that you want to do. Um, so that's really solopreneur. And a lot of times there is a cap on what solopreneurs can make because they aren't delegating and elevating other people on their teams. Um, entrepreneurs, on the other hand, um, and you can be a serial entrepreneur, you can have tons of other businesses, but this really is, is that you are looking to build teams, to grow teams, to lead people, to teach, to mentor, to have ripples within your community and, and leave a legacy so much bigger than yourself. So entrepreneurs, um, they can um, and hopefully do uh, have 10-year uh, plans, 50-year plans, 100-year plans, that it goes so much for, farther than um, just living life on their terms. Like they, they just, they're, they're leaving a piece of themselves on the earth um, for other people to, to move forward. Mm. That's so good. You know, one of the things that really struck me, Chris, when you were talking, uh, because, and, and I think I might've shared this with you, that I am 100% an entrepreneur, but I am operating like a solopreneur, right? So I, meaning, and, and one of the things that you had shared with me was that entrepreneurs really have a mission to scale their businesses, right? They, they know what, and like you said, whether that's the three-year, five-year, 10-year plan, um, but they have a desire to grow and expand and hire people as where a solopreneur has zero interest in that. They, they don't mind being the bottle washer and the janitor and, and the chef and the CEO and the delivery person, like they do it all. And I realized that for me, um, that I am really, you know, just in complete transparency with all of you gorgeous women, um, I'm definitely in an uncomfortable place right now because the work and the opportunities that are there for me cannot possibly be managed by one person. And so from a business perspective and from a money perspective, that puts a cap on what I can actually generate simply because I'm limited on resources, right? 
So because I can't be in 20 places at once and call 100 people and, you know, do all of the things that a business that is on the path of scaling can do, uh, it requires a different mindset. But because I think and operate like an entrepreneur, it's hard for me to like put on the brakes and kind of slow my roll and just be like, oh, I'm just going to operate like a solopreneur. So from a financial perspective, Chris, uh, what have you found especially like when it comes to budget and when it comes to numbers, which I know is a really big passion for you. Um, what can entrepreneurs or solopreneurs begin to do? Like what are some of the steps that they could start to take to really get into their numbers and identify like what is actually needed to start growing their business? I mean, should they, um, you know, and you can get as specific as, as you want, but, you know, if, if a business is making 60 grand and they want to make 150 grand, or if they're doing 200 grand and they want to make a million dollars, like how do, what do you say to people that come to you and just say, I want to make more money? Like, where do they start? Hold on one moment. Everybody. Yes. This is like live TV, you guys. <laughs> this is real life. We always check with each other when we're leaving the office if we want the AC to stay on or not. That's so great. <laughs> and but... I said, yes, please. <laughs> um, okay, that's a great question. Um, and I think too, a lot of us entrepreneurs fall into it accidentally. Um, I know when I launched TNT, I did not want to be an entrepreneur. I just didn't want to work for anybody else anymore. Um, I didn't want my financial story in the hands of someone else. That was bottom line. Um, 12 years later now, we do have a team of, uh, I think about 30 and we telecommute all over the world. So from what I can share with you, um, I was a very accidental leader, um, very accidental budgeter, even though that's what we do for everybody else. Um, we created a couple of worksheets, worksheets. We call it our income and impact worksheet. And really what we tell um, anybody who's in this position is it's, it's never too early to start. Even if it's just you, um, getting your books into your finances into QuickBooks, or there's a couple of free platforms as well. But that is the number one thing we say. Um, Excel spreadsheets are okay, except that it's very hard to pull reports year over year and to do cash flow analysis and that sort of thing. So getting it into a legit uh, accounting software um, is the number one thing we say for budgeting. And that is for a couple of reasons. You know exactly where your money's coming and going um, and you're more aware of it because uh, without that, you just kind of rationalize anything that you're spending and then saying, oh, well, that job I just completed covers that cost. Again, that's the broke even mentality. Um, so that would be the number one thing. And then the second thing with this income and impact worksheet, even if it's just you, you list every expense that it's going to take you to run your business and then you add in a profit multiplier. So if you wanna scale, let's say you wanna hire someone in maybe two years, what is it gonna to cost to do that? You add this profit multiplier in, and then that tells you exactly what the revenue is that you need to be charging for your services. Um, and as a woman, this is just me, like I had a very difficult time charging what we were worth. When we first started TNT, we charged $27 an hour for our service. And now we charge $250 an hour. So it took a long time. And to have the income and impact worksheet made it clear as day. If we want to pay our people competitive wages and we want to do 401k and we want to do XYZ, we have to make sure it goes in this plan with a profit multiplier to make sure that we can keep growing it that way. Because if it was just me, I would probably still be charging $27 an hour and feeling, you know, I, I would just because I love what I do. But now that there's people relying on us and our service is the ROI on what people get when they partner with us is priceless. And so when you know what you're providing for someone and you are the expert and they could go to anywhere else that you make them feel like a million bucks, they are going to pay you what you're worth. But now you have the data behind saying, this is what I'm worth and why. Um, and for me, that was priceless. Like I, I, just, I also can't put a dollar on that because even when I'm talking to our leadership team going, mm, you sure about that price? And they show the data, I'm like, all right, let's roll. Um, so for that, that would be why. And a lot of people um, don't put what they wanna make. So let's say 
example, you want to make six figures, you want to make a hundred grand. What do you actually need to charge for your services on average to be making that amount? Um, so that that is what you're just putting in that. You have Zoom, you have um, whatever platforms you're using, like they all add up these hidden costs that you're not even expecting or thinking about. Um, right now we don't have much fuel, but let's say you're you're, you do have to drive to your clients, making sure the fuel's in there. It's all these little micro budget things that people don't think about that makes them get to broke even. And then they're working 80 hour work weeks, making $13 an hour. Um, and it's just the hamster wheel keeps going. You know, um, I had an issue. I'm still not exactly sure what it was, but a, a couple things happened for me. We had a really crooked bookkeeper or accountant, an actual CPA who used to work for the IRS, um, who we thought, my God, we're in great hands because he could just make a phone call and like things would get put on hold. And anyway, six work, six years worth of accounting, we recently found out we're just out the window. He never filed. Um, so we're working with a new CPA now and all of the things that I thought were in QuickBooks, uh, m mysteriously disappeared. So I've had to, with the exception of 2019, I've had to go back through and manually like print out statements. And I mean, it has been so painful and so arduous. I can't even tell you. However, uh, it has been one of those, uh, jaw dropping uh, awakening, uh, empowering experiences because I have been paying for Spotify three times every month. I don't, I must have signed up three times. Um, I have actually like run the numbers on what I've paid for like education or workshops or retreats or symposiums or books or like it is just um, a couple things that happened. The amount of money that we actually made is astounding, as is the amount of money that we spent. Um, so I'm so grateful uh, that I'm having this conversation with you tonight, Chris, for the conversation we had a couple of weeks ago. I know that one of the things that you do is you go in and you help companies pull back the veil on that discomfort um, and showing somebody who really cares, who you can really trust, uh, who really wants to see you win. And I think that's key for me, Chris. And that was one of the reasons I was so excited to have this conversation with you. I know that you and the entire team at TNT want to see your clients win. And that's a hell of a lot different than the CPA who I thought had the magic wand because he worked for the IRS and he could call the state, he could call, he didn't do any, all he was doing was, was stalling. Um, and getting more money from us and not doing anything. And I know that you actually will go in and help companies uh, see what is possible, but also see the things that can be really uncomfortable. So can you speak a little bit to that? And, and you, again, I'm so grateful for it. You at the very beginning of our call talked about that embarrassment and the shame and I don't know. I think it would be an interesting conversation. I don't know if men experience the same kind of shame around money the way women do. Um, the way that I've experienced men having shame around money is if they are in a relationship with somebody who's making more money than them. But other than that, I've not experienced men having the same dilemmas with money as, as women do. So um, how do we, how do we, increase our tolerance for that discomfort? And do you have any suggestions on how we can really work toward getting around and over and, and confronting that embarrassment and that shame while also declaring unequivocally, unapologetically what we actually want? Ooh, heavy. Um, anybody here love to talk about money? <laughs> like it's your favorite thing ever? Like you would do it all day long if you could? <laughs> How about talking about your own money? Anybody here just want to like open up your bank account right now and show us all what you got in the bank? You want to do that? No, no, I didn't think so. Um, we have a love-hate relationship with all of our clients. 
they love us because we help them and they hate us because we're looking at everything about them. Um, a business is an extension of a person's soul. I just, it, it truly is like, it is who we are like inside. Um, I'll just turn in my office. I have all the core, maybe you can see all of our core values on the wall over here. Um, Chris, would you read those to us? Yeah. So active listeners, authentic, bold, courageous, and transparent. Those are, those are what we live by. Beautiful. Um, and it's true when we, businesses typically only come to us when they're in financial duress. Um, they, we don't get hired before that really. Um, it's very rare. It's, it's amazing. And we love it when we get a blank slate of QuickBooks and they have no loans or anything like that. Um, so uh, it's hard. So businesses are an extension of, of the owner's soul. And then when we are talking about their finances, it's like, it's like we're up close on their zits, really. Um, like it's uh, every, every mentor session there that I, I do five a week still um, that, that we mentor they're always like, Chris, I didn't want to come today. I don't, I know that there's a problem, but I don't really want to talk about it. Um, and granted we have businesses we're mentoring that are closing down because of COVID and businesses that are doing incredible because of COVID. We run the gamut right now. Um, and even the businesses is, that are doing incredible are still like, I don't want to talk about money. I just want to do the fun things. I just want to create things. I don't want to sit here and talk about um, our productivity or what the profit margins are. So, um, Having those conversations all the time um, takes a lot of trust. So hearing about bookkeepers not doing their jobs or accountants not doing their jobs, it just like, it hurts even more because that makes people even more hesitant to reach out about their finances um, because you talk about the horror stories and you're like, no, fine, I'm not opening up my books to, to an outside party to help because so-and-so had an awful experience. And so I'm gonna have that same experience. We run into that all the time. Um, we also run into the things where business owners are running a lot of their personal expenses through the business. So they don't want us to do their books either because they know they're going to have to change. They have to look in a mirror and see they're probably part of the reason or I'm gonna take, they are the whole reason their business is um, financially struggling. Um, and that's hard to do and talk about doing that through zoom right now. Um, is a whole different level of empathy that uh, our team has had to dig into um, because you can turn your video off, you can mute someone, you can do all the things that you would never ever do when you're in a meeting room face to face. So um, that would really, that, that's, that's, so we, we tell people when we're meeting with them that we are going to challenge every belief you've ever had about money. We are going to challenge the status quo um, 99% of the businesses we work with are women. So even that we have, um, CEOs that are still in million dollar businesses making $60,000 a year because they feel guilty taking more money. So we challenge all of those conversations. They're paying people on their team more than they're making themselves. Um, so we challenge all of that and, and we really lead them to believe you're worth it. Um, so we're not just talking about money at that point. We're talking about the human being and their belief system and the story they tell themselves. As for men, we mentor quite a few men and their businesses and they do, when their business is failing, um, they don't stick with us as long. We have noticed they won't, they won't stick around for the hard conversations. Um, I come from a very blessed family. When I got adopted, um, my mom was the breadwinner and my dad was a stay at home dad. So I have a very unique and different life story at this point. And then when I started making more than my husband, he, um, made me take him out to eat. So I, I come from very, very supportive male roles in my life. So, um, but when we do mentor men, um, it's the same thing. They still come to us when they're quite a bit in debt. Very good. So Chris, we, uh, we've got about 20 minutes left and I wanna make sure that we get to uh, any suggestions or any points that you really want to emphasize uh, with anybody that is, you know, in any number of these places or a combination of and, and want to proactively change their relationship with money. 
Um, so whether they are somebody who is employed by somebody and they feel like they're living paycheck to paycheck or whether they are, you know, running a, a multi-million dollar business or, you know, a hundred thousand dollar business, or they're hoping to get to a hundred thousand dollars, what is a really great place for them to start? Obviously read the toilet paper entrepreneur. Was that what it was called? Toilet paper entrepreneur? Yep. Uh, there's another book. I don't know if you've heard of it, um, but it's uh, Money, a Love Story um, <clears throat> by, uh, by Kate Northrop. And um, yeah, I'm just wondering, like, what are some things that they could begin to do in addition to reaching out to you for a conversation um, to see if there might be uh, even, you know, even just having a strategy session with you or going into potentially a longer, you know, kind of commitment with you potentially, you know, based on obviously if it's a good fit for everybody, but um, reading the toilet paper entrepreneur, giving you a call and having a strategic conversation, are there any tips that you could give them that they could do like starting tomorrow, like just like, just to begin to, you know, to loosen up that tension and to move themselves closer to where they actually want to be. So takeaways, takeaways. Um, who here does their finances every day? Every week? Okay. Or three? Every month? Okay. Oh. Okay. Now. <laughs> now. Okay. Um, so that would be the first step that I would do is do a weekly budget. Um, a lot of people look at their budget on a monthly basis. Um, and that's a little bit harder to track your ins and outs that way. Um, at TNT, we do our money every day. Um, our integrator is in the, the, our um, cash forecasting every day, updating expenses that are coming in and out, um, just so we're not surprised by anything. So that, that would be the first thing, start doing your budget on a weekly basis. Um, and if you can, um, that you can do in Excel. So um, if you wanna do it for your business, it's nice to get on reoccurring static revenue um, and figure out what that looks. If you're looking for personal finances, do it on when you get paid. So um, if it's weekly, bi-weekly, whatever that looks like, because um, when you do it on a monthly basis, it's really easy to say, let's say you have $6,000 a month coming in and you have $5,000 expenses, but the dates don't quite line up. Um, and then you overdraw because you didn't line up everything. So I think that starting tomorrow would be figure out your budget on a weekly basis. Um, and for that, um, usually the interactive, what would be the... Um, what would be the pro pros of doing it on a weekly basis? What do you think you would see see with your finances doing it that way? That's open to everybody. That's a question that you're posing to the group, right, Chris? Mm -hmm. so you see, Chris, what, you Chris, see exactly what it is that you're doing on a regular basis that you might be doing consciously or unconsciously especially when you're talking about your numbers. I mean, how frequently you just go, oh, I'm just going to get your coffee today. Okay, so is that really in your budget to do that? Or what, can you just like make coffee and it just be something that you can save that kind of money? So that's what I, I've noticed that you see your habits. You see what you're consciously and unconsciously doing and seeing how that relates to what your overall goals and objectives are. And then you can figure out how to course correct from there. That's exactly right, right LaVon. There's that saying that that $4 has cost you $10,000 without you even knowing it. Mm. Um, and then you become doing it on a weekly basis, you become very intentional with your finances. Uh, we call it the 48 hour rule that before you buy something, you wait 48 hours and you research three different places that you could get it at a better price. So you just pause, you take a breath and you pause. So that's a lot of what the weekly the budget. So that would be the number one thing because that's consistent. Weekly budgets, consistency. You know, I, I think that you also see, like you mentioned, Sean Marie, that you were paying for Spotify three times. You didn't realize it. I mean, we, I catch so many things and I'll say, did you buy this? Like, no, I didn't buy this. There were three charges um, to DoorDash in a city I was not in, you know, that added up to almost $300 in one day. 
And, you know, if I hadn't happened to look at the bank that day, you know, so much stuff happens online now. Um, you signed up for something, you forget you signed up for something, somebody's gotten a hold of something, and there you go, $300, you know. That's big. That's, that's a lot of money. To me, that's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of money. It is. <laughs> And, you know, and, and I, and I found that doing that exercise, it was almost like, um, fairly quickly, I was able to turn it into a less painful exercise and look at it more of an exploration of finding money of like, where can I find money? And so I canceled subscriptions that I had completely forgotten about that I had. And, um, it was just, it was truly empowering. And when I'd had my first business a hundred years ago, um, I was always in the books. Like I just, there, there wasn't, there literally wasn't a week and possibly a day that would go by where I didn't know if we were up or down or what our revenue was. And, and I was just more dialed in and I forgot, you know, so I, and I, and I want to share that too, because it, it is an ongoing practice. And Chris, when you were sharing, like, it doesn't happen overnight right? It really is a practice and that consistency. And um, yeah, there's a lot of power to that. But so I would like to also add, Chris, like maybe sometime this week, if everybody goes, you know, into their accounting to, you know, look to see if there's any found money to be had, you know, maybe something that you are paying a, pers a subscription that you really don't use, or you really don't need, or, um, and LaVon, like you were saying, like that cup of coffee, you know, my goodness, gosh, you know, um, when we start thinking of what the value really is on that, and, and even Chris, when you were just saying like that $4 or $10 cost you $10,000 in the long run, like that's a whole different spin on $4. Mm -hmm. It's powerful. Chris, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So I'm very like on every single dime. That's how I live my life. And I've learned I need to be stuck I had to step away from it because it was so obsessive. Like, like I don't drink coffee. I used to work at Starbucks and I used to watch everyone spend their money. I don't do that. But it's like, I found it was a little more happier to just not worry because when I think of being plentiful, it's like the opposite of like looking at every dime. So how do you, what do you suggest for finding the, the good in between of that? So what do you do to find the good in between instead of being obsessive about it? How do you... How do you free yourself a little bit? Um, well, I what I did is I hired somebody else. So I don't look at it every day. Our integrator looks at it every day. So maybe for you, it would be getting a bookkeeper or a virtual assistant that's in there doing that for you. Um, the other thing is if you're doing it on a weekly basis, that's still, you know, if you set Tuesday at nine to 10 a.m. as the only time you're looking at your budget and you're holding to that, Maybe in that um, structure, it will be freeing instead of you locking in the bank every half hour, what just went through it, you yeah. know, maybe doing just so that in that structure, you're creating freedom for the rest of your life. So that might be. And even like when you're out too, what do you, how do you not feel bad when you do want to purchase or do you give yourself a plentiful budget? Is that like a key to not be so stingy on your budget for yourself? Is it to give yourself more, like you said? Clarifying question there, are you talking about personal or business? I think now I'm talking about personal okay. <laughs> and just in general, like what, how to not, you know, do you give yourself a plentiful budget? I get personally. Yeah. So do you just, me, I do it all on a weekly basis and I have a fixed budget. So, um, and I, and I sit down at the beginning of every month and make, map out to make sure that it's what it is. So if I want to buy shoes that month, that's going in the budget. If I want to make sure I'm going out with friends, I'm an introvert. So that doesn't happen very often, but if I'm going out, I make sure my gift cards are all loaded. So I'm not actually spending the money. It's on my gift cards. Um, so every, at the beginning of every month, I have about five gift cards that I just load up with $50 each. And that's all I get for probably the month or four months, depending on, on what it is. Um, so no, I don't, I don't have a free for all. And then I still only get $20 a week allowance 12 years later. So that's, that's wow. the money I get to spend on whatever I want. That's not allocated to anything. It's, it's my allowance. Good question. For the business, um, I have a $50 a month to take out a client budget. 
if I want more, I have to go to our leadership team and explain why I want more. <laughs> Lizzie, did you have a question? Sorry, unmuting. Yeah, okay. I just um, on the business side, something you said earlier really resonated with me and I wanted to ask you a little bit more about it. But when you were talking about um, how you really have to figure out what you're worth and charging that, um, and, and I know that's difficult for everyone and figuring that out, um, but I'm thinking like my husband has his own um, business. He's a graphic designer um, and has had to change that. And I'm moving from working full-time at an organization to consulting work and having to figure out for me, like what I want my feed to be. And so I'm looking at like what I made before, plus uh, figuring out what the monthly cost or hourly cost of my benefits and everything were would were then that were covered that aren't now and adding that in. Um, but even that is still hard because then that seems like so much as an hourly cost. <laughs> Do you have any suggestions or um wisdom about how to do that or how you get more comfortable with doing that um and I know you said it you know when other people are depending on you but for like us where it's just one or maybe two people um how how do you get comfortable how do you make yourself do that and still do it like um accurately and and everything that's great and congratulations for um going out on your own on consulting that's it's a big step so how do you get more comfortable charging what you're worth and how do you figure out what that dollar amount is? So for me, um, I wouldn't even take what your salary was, what you were making before. It's what salary do you want now? Um, and it's not what you need to get by, it's what you want to make. It's a big distinction there. So, um, so let's say you wanna make $100,000 a year and then figure out whatever the benefits were that we, you had there, tack those on. Then whatever expenses it costs for you to run your business, tack those on. And then I always like to add in a 50% multiplier because we're service industry. You could, if, if that seems way too high for you, keep knocking it down till what, 2%, whatever. Just make sure that there is some money in that profit multiplier um, because that will scale you or that will cover any emergency expenses that come up that aren't allocated in your budget. Um, and then practice in front of a mirror. Like, so when we first raised our prices from 175 to 200, literally our whole team sat around and practiced in front of each other. So they felt good about it and why they were doing it. Um, because if you just go to someone and you're like, um, well, we're going to charge $200 an hour now. Is that okay? What do you think their response is going to be? Are they going to lose faith in you? Yes. If you're going to be like, we charge $200 an hour. We're amazing. This is the ROI that you're going to get on this. This is everything that's included in your own package. Um, and I'm really excited to look forward to with, I'm really excited to work with you because these are the ideas I have for your platform. Boom. Like it's a whole different, like they want to be part of that, of what you're now cultivating your vibe, your energy, um, because they partner with you because they like you. Um, and then whatever you're charging, if the value you provide, um, they're going to pay, they would pay 10 times that because of what you're actually um, creating. So that would really be it. Practice, practice, practice. It's, it's a confidence thing. Um, and for me, I still get really nervous because we're raising our prices and we're going to a membership um, platform. It's the same thing. We're launching that December 1st. You can bet our entire team on Zoom, we're going to be moving into chat rooms and we are going to be practicing that ourselves because um, it never gets easier, ever, ever. Um, and then the only other thing I can do is um, get a friend, your tribe that you trust and practice with them. Um, and then have them tell you why people would pay for your service and, and what the value is there. So, Beautiful. Lizzie, I have a quick question for you. Um, do you have a, do you have a list or a database of clients that you, um, that, that, you will begin to reach out to and cultivate conversations with and, you know, and start to really um, expand on those relationships and conversations? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of falling into this um, by accident. It wasn't a plan where I was working before because of COVID restructured and everything. And, um, and this just kind of fell in my lap. And I was like, hey, yeah, this is great if I can consult and do that. <laughs> 
the same thing. So yeah, I do have um, a very short list, but I haven't started um, doing any of that yet. So I'm uh, someone I've, I've worked with before and wanted to bring me on to do this um, as a consultant that I've been working with. And so it's a little bit safer because I already know them and <laughs> I yes. can feel some of this out. But yeah, I think once like you said, Chris, as soon as I get more confident about it and have that figured out, I'll definitely be using that list and trying to cultivate more relationships and go down there. Yeah. And I, I just want to acknowledge something like I, I, and I think that there's, because there's so much information and great coaches and great, you know, programs and all of this conversation, this big buzz around growing your business and having this list and having a million followers and this and that. And I just want to really take a minute and acknowledge like this small starter list, like our list, our email list, like that is gold. Like that is, there is so much worth and value in our list and our fans and fo- like all of that is wonderful. But I really feel like, and it might be a little antiquated for some people that think like social media is the end all and be all. But I really think, Lizzie, like when you start and you just start communicating with this list and having conversations with them, and I love what Chris said as far as like practicing and um, and getting with somebody that you really trust, I could not agree with her more. And I just want to add to that, that I also believe like there is a knowingness in you, Lizzie, like there is a number that probably feels really good. Um, And it might be a little bit scary, but you're like, God, this, this number feels really good to me. And this number would be fantastic, but I would feel absurd asking for that. But this number, I would feel like I was shortchanging myself if I asked for that. So I think in addition to operating off of this strategy that Chris is talking about, which is really like when it is in black and white and you're looking at it on paper and you know what your incoming costs are and your outgoing expenses, um, like when you've got those numbers, they don't lie. And I also want to say that there is an intuitive knowingness that complements that strategy. And like Chris was saying earlier, like when we're just like all airy fairy, like, oh, it's just going to come to me and I'm going to charge $500 an hour because somebody told me I was worth it. Um, If we've not done the work so that what we're asking for actually has the foundation to take root, we might get $500 an hour, but it's not gonna last, right? We might get $50 an hour and it won't last because if it's not rooted in like what Chris was talking about in real confidence and a real knowingness, then it, it has no basis for growth, right? It's like, it's like sowing seeds, um, you know, on a dirt lot without actually cultivating the soil. So I think in combination with taking a real practical strategic approach, as well as trusting your instincts and saying, God, you know what, this number, this would feel really good to me. And then maybe starting there with looking at like, does that number align with what it says on paper? Right. But I think it's a really great place to start because I think you already know, like there's probably an area you're like, I kind of want to be between this and this, and it feels really good. And I know that I'm worth it. And I know that I can deliver. And if I push the edge of that, it's a little scary, but kind of exciting. Um, But we know, right. We know that when we lowball ourselves, um, it feels shitty. Like it just doesn't feel good, but we also know when we go in and we're like all puffed up because we just came from a Tony Robbins seminar or whatever, and we're going to go in and we're going to ask for the big bucks, but we haven't really done the work where we can deliver on that big ticket item. And I don't think it's not that we're not worth the big ticket, but if we've not done the work where we can actually deliver, then that's it's going to be nerve wracking. And, and the money in my experience, uh, it, it doesn't, it's not comfortable because we get that big paycheck and then we're like, holy shit, what did I do? I don't even like them. Like they sell cigarettes and I don't like tobacco or they're, you know, they're probably into something shady. Um, but they had them like, and you'll learn this, like, welcome to the club, Chris. I'm sure Chris has got stories up the wazoo. She could tell you, but Um, you're going to learn as you go, but I just really felt compelled Lizzie to just say, I think, you know, 
Like, I think you have a knowingness. And I think if you can combine looking at it at, on paper and just being like, how does this really feel? And how does this actually look like? Does the data back up how it feels? Um, I think you've got this. I do. And it's okay to be scared. Like Danielle Laporte says, you can be really scared and really ready. Yes, 100%. I think, uh, I don't know if all of you do suffer. I suffer from imposter syndrome. And every time something goes right, I'm like, ah, I just got lucky team. That worksheet just worked because that's just pure luck. You've been doing this 12 years and it's still just luck. It's um, so 100% that I don't think that feeling ever goes away. You learn though that every entrepreneur is faking it as they make it. Like we're just making stuff up and throwing stuff at the wall to see what works and figuring out how to scale it after that. So for everybody here, know that uh, it doesn't matter if you've been in business one year, 12 years. And Lizzie, thank you for sharing a little bit. Sounds like our stories are very similar from our beginnings. Um, I would have loved if someone had shared with me what I just shared with you because I charged $27.50 when I first started and it felt shitty. It felt awful and I felt taken advantage of and $200 is our sweet spot and 250 makes me feel real uncomfortable and that's what we pay or we charge. Um, but I will tell you when we had the people who were paying the little rate and we raised our prices, they did not stay um, because they got that at such a cheap value that they did not want to pay more. And then we replaced those with people who loved what we did and saw the value in it. So yes, there are so many stories we could tell um, about the launch of TNT. We're in a place now where we interview anybody we work with. We're very selective on who we work with. Um, and the people who are, I just read that 100,000 businesses have closed because of COVID um, because they're, they were not financially stable. Like your business should be ready for any crises. Your restructuring for your business, if anybody's going through this, is because um, the business owners were not financially ready for a crisis. So um, that's 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 really what that profit multiplier is, um, and it's so important. Mm, 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 mm. Hundred thousand small businesses. We are the. I, I didn't look up the alternating to see how many businesses launched. I could tell you, launching in a recession is beautiful. It's the best time to launch your business. Thank you, Contessa. Bye. Bye, Contessa. Thank you. Um, so launching right now, it's beautiful. It's a great time to launch. Um, beautiful time. It's very. It's much harder being a mature business right now than than launching. Gosh, Chris, I could do this with you all night. Um, I know that we don't have the time to do that, but. Um, I would love to do this again. I would love to make this a part one and have a follow-up part two with you. This is really, really important stuff. And uh, I completely concur. I think this is an incredible time to start a business and, you know, be careful what you wish for, because, you know, I think when you have that alignment and, you know, Chris, the one thing that we didn't get into was the, you know, the um, concept, the idea, the practicalities around the law of attraction, around manifesting. Um, and I know that you and I both have a, a pretty strong connection to that. Um, and it's not all airy fairy or loosey goosey or esoteric, although there are components of that, of course, but um, it's really rooted in science and fact. And so maybe you and I can dive into that a little bit the next time around. Um, but Chris, I'd really love it if you would tell everybody how to find you, where to reach you. Um, where they could go to have a conversation with you. Yeah, um, we have a website, <laughs> but I think the easiest, the way that I will uh, definitely respond personally and know who you are is if you just email me. It's Chris, C-R-Y-S at T-N-T dynamite.com. I'll put it in the chat right now. So um, Beautiful. I'm not Thank a phonetic you. person. <laughs> I was trying to, but my keyboard is locked up. I don't know if Mercury's in retrograde, but mm -hmm. uh, you got, thank you, Chris. So everybody, then, Chris's um, email is in the chat. There's my personal cell phone number. I love to text. I'm emojis texting kind of gal. Um, so that's my preferred mode of co uh, conversation. But um, if you want to visit our website, we have a, our quarter. This one was getting blogs on there. So there's a lot of financial free advice for anyone who's launching and ways that, to start, um, books to read, that sort of stuff. So um, uh, 
and to you, Dr. And I, and I want to say too, Chris, um, your website just makes me happy. <laughs> Like, I love that it's like this financially based, like hardcore, like I, like you said, like, it's really uncomfortable. Like you're going to get in there and pull the curtains back and look at people's money and have those really tough, but really sweet, honest, necessary conversations. But I just, every time I go to your website, I'm like, God, it just, it just makes me happy. It just makes me feel good. So, um, and I'm hoping, uh, fingers crossed by the time we all circle up again, um, I might be one of the lucky ones that Chris took on as a client. So we'll see to be continued. <laughs> yep, we run the gamut. We do everything from your basic bookkeeping skills all the way up to interim CFO. So we have every everything for your budget and whatever line that you are in your business, we, we can accommodate. We pay bills. We do your invoicing. Any, anything along the lines that you're learning how to do. Um, we do, and it's a flat rate, so it's not per hour. You put it static in your budget, and it stays that way. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, Chris, you were such a delight, and like I said, I wish that we had a few more hours to do this, but maybe, um, I don't know, maybe that's something we should we should be cooking up, uh, because I think this is a really, really important, very timely conversation, so Thank you, my friend, so much Thank for you, being everybody. here tonight, for giving such great advice, for being so open and so lovely. It was, it was really a treat. So thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody. And your questions were phenomenal. And everybody, I want to thank you for being here tonight and joining Chris and I. And Patty, thank you for being my wonderful partner in, uh, in all things uh, Women Lead Online Forms. This has been so lovely. You're such a great uh, partner and host. So thank you very much, Patty. And to those of you listening to the recording, we're really grateful. Please reach out to Chris. She is a, ph a phenom and uh, yeah, she's just the real deal and she's got a heart of gold. So I hope that you will, I hope you'll reach out and take advantage of that. Uh, and I'm going to leave you as I do every month with one of my favorite quotes by one of my favorite writers, Tony Hoagland. And it's this, some people think the truth is the worst thing that can happen. The truth is not the worst thing that can happen. So thank you, everybody. Do great things, and we'll see you again really soon. Bye for now. Bye, everybody.